Hey everybody. So today we decided to have a conversation about stopping the madness. So you know the situation when you've joined an organization, maybe you've been part of an organization for many years, and as things have evolved, maybe the system is under pressure to change, old systems need to die out, but they're kind of fighting to stay in control. And you end up with a perhaps senior leadership tone within the organization that is all around trying to predict and control and keep things really structured and lead almost through fear and driving, driving, driving for results in a rapidly changing context that no longer allows for that style and that methodology of leading. It's almost like well, it worked before, why won't it work now? Let's just double down on predict and control. And pretty soon you wake up and you're like, my goodness, what has happened to the leadership in this organization? It's become quite toxic or uh, it really feels like they're trying to drive results through fear. And you don't want to cascade that down in your leadership. You take a stand for more empowerment, more possibilities, and yet, you face this. And so the challenge is, how do you stop the madness? You, you see it, you understand you need to be effective within it, but you don't want to be a conveyor of that kind of fear-based culture. So how do you stop the madness where you are? So that's kind of one of the things that we wanted to reflect on because unfortunately, we're seeing more and more of it in a lot of organizations. I think it's also a byproduct of Again, this older style of leadership, not knowing how to truly adapt and therefore driving for short-term results, because you can get results through fear in the short term. It's just not a winning strategy for the long term. And maybe some of these senior leaders may not be around for the long term. So get the results, squeeze out the value, you know, move on to the next thing. It's not that that's always the case, but it puts a lot of good leaders in some very difficult situations. So, Absolutely. what well, do you find? So you when, when, I mean, you've talked about this, you know, Rianne, and, and we've, we've spent a lot of time talking with leaders about this. This is so common, you know, in, in large corporations in, in particular today. You know, the speed at which things are evolving, right? Yeah. Technology, the speed, the competition, you know, global competition, all of this. And it's just easy just to get caught up in that speed. Yeah. RPMs, right? Where you're just trying to do things instead of thinking and then doing things, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for me, you know, as I think about this, you know, part of it is just that slowing down that we've talked about before. Yeah. How do you just center yourself for a moment? You know, take that deep breath. Okay, time out for yourself for one moment. Like, what is going on here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the first thing is just change speed, right? Downshift, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's like fundamentally right. to, to enable you to kind of collect your thoughts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's a great first step because I don't know about you all, but I think it's very easy to get your nervous system dysregulated and then that drives emotions that can fuel immediate reactivity. So good basic emotional intelligence and physiological kind of self-regulation is exactly that, right? Down, downshift. Um, the other thing that helps me and, and that I share with the leaders I work with is this idea of observe, don't absorb. It is so easy when you're in that environment and you are encircled with 95% of the people around you kind of just um, assimilating that energy and wanting to drive in the same way to, to kind of, number one, absorb this negative energy because mm -hmm. likely, oftentimes this kind of, um, I would argue it's not even really healthy leadership. It's more like they're trying to manage results rather than really leading, but it's mm -hmm. it can be very personally targeting, mm -hmm. tar you know, targeting the person. Um, uh, it can be an unhealthy kind of um, almost personal attack. Oftentimes it can also be, if it's not as direct, it can be um, destabilizing and undermining, right? And so all of these um, behaviors and the resulting emotional impact, it's if you don't find a way to discharge the energy, 
it's easy it's easy to kind of succumb to that as the norm mm -hmm. and then absorb it within yourself and over time it stacks up and then suddenly mm -hmm. your ability to respond with greater resourcefulness is diminished obviously so in the moment how can i keep myself grounded i love the the kind of downshift to a slower pace focus on the breath and then observe what am i observing what's the behavior um, and what's the impact mm -hmm. and then if you're really um in a place where it makes sense to share your observation, you can even share, I'm noticing um, that you're um, assigning blame in my direction with regards to this. I, here's what I own. I also hear you sharing this with a tone of frustration or impatience. That's how I'm receiving it. I get that we want results and I'm absolutely committed to that. Here's what I would propose. And, and then there's either a request or an offer. So there's, you know, Again, if you're coming from a place of observation versus absorption, it puts you in a more personally resourceful place mm -hmm. to be able to be that third party observer, but you have to also own what your contributions are and draw effective boundaries around what you will and you will not receive in terms of how you'll be communicated. To. Yeah, I, I love that, you know, observe versus absorb, right? It's a, it's a great distinction. You know, and what triggered for me as you were talking about that was when you're sort of observing, you can self-observe it and observe, hey, there's a lot of heat coming my way, mm -hmm. right? I mean, for you should sure. feel it. Yeah. Right? And so you don't want to just conduct the heat, right? You right. Know, onto the, the rest of the people. And it's, you know, for me, it's that time to say, when I'm feeling that heat, look for the light mm -hmm. among the heat, right? Where, where's the insight from the light you might get or the insights you might gain from, okay, this is a pressure packed situation or these are really uh, dramatic times where we need to make some very specific choices. Right. And so slowing down, observing versus absorbing puts you in a place where you can then be, make a distinction between the heat that you're feeling and the light that you're looking for, mm -hmm. right? And say, what, where's, you know, how can I dissipate that heat? You know, or how can I, how can I manage that in a way that enables me to be that resourceful person that mm -hmm. you know, you're talking about, Leanne? And um, just that noticing within yourself versus even what's on around me mm -hmm. you know, is, is going to be an important factor in saying, where am I at you yeah. know, in this thing in terms of what I'm noticing and what I'm absorbing, mm -hmm. right? Maybe not, mm -hmm. you know? And so sometimes as human beings, Sometimes we're not at our best when we do this, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens when it's like, yeah, this is all well and good. I wish I would remember what Rick and Leanne maybe said in this video, but I didn't see it before. And I had this moment where it's like, I wasn't at my finest. Right? Oh, sure. Then, then what happens? Well, and I think this is one of the questions that a lot of leaders grapple with is, despite my best intent, despite the fact that I swore I am never going to become, you know how you, like, think you're never going to become your mother and then you wake up one day or your father and then you're like oh my goodness I've become some aspect of my parent right I think also when we're around an environment that is um, ruling by fear we can unintentionally despite everything we just articulated absorb more of that way of being and you may wake up and say oh my gosh I have actually been now cascading down a culture of leading through pressure versus inspiring um, creative resourcefulness. And now it's always a balance, right? When we coach, we, we, we do a combination of supporting as well as challenging. So of course there's a balance between that. How do you stretch someone outside their comfort zone and then help you know support them in stepping into that potential? But I'm talking about when you just move a not sure too far and you're really leading more through fear so then what what do you do um i don't know about what what you've observed is helpful for yourself or other leaders rick but i notice um there's one leader that was really inspired by how he was able to actually share some feedback and, and coach um, one of his team members and then his team member was courageous enough to share i've noticed that you started to shift your own leadership and he received it so well and said, you know, I'm so grateful that you've reflected this to me. This is such a gift. Um, I've 
why I've noticed that there's something different in the, in the team's energy and here's my contribution because I'm the leader, right? And I think what it's doing is facilitating a whole uh, deeper reflection and um, next, a group conversation around here's my contribution to the energy that we've created as a team together and here's how I want to re-anchor in. In the, in the work that I do in a program called Recalibrate for Impact, it's exactly that idea. It's how do you recalibrate back to your core um, values, purpose, and um, gifts that you can bring to the world around you for greater impact in a rapidly changing landscape. And there's a concept of this leaning tower of Pisa where you can build and build and build your life based on your values, but suddenly you start acting out of alignment with your values. And one day you wake up and you look in the mirror and you go, oh my goodness, I'm the leaning tower of Pisa. You know, I, I've, I've become out of congruence with who I am and the kind of culture I want to lead. And so then it's like own it and share with your, with first get clear within yourself and then share with your team, it's time to reset. Let's recalibrate our way back to a more, um, not just empowering, but this is about results. This is about how can we create the climate in which we can achieve our collective aims together. And that requires um, leadership courage, um, authenticity and vulnerability, but what's possible out of that is um, infinitely uh, more impactful than allowing ourselves to slowly kind of drift into a style of leadership that leads us outside of ourselves. I don't know, what do you, what do you yeah, notice? You know, it's so wonderful, you know, just what you've articulated, Leanne. And a couple of things that I would add to that. One is, you know, as you find yourself, like it was at my finest moment, or I'm, I'm in this space and I don't want to be this leader that I'm behaving like, right? Mm -hmm. First thing I would say is, be kind to yourself. Forgive yourself easily. Yeah. Right? You're a human being, right? We, yeah. we make mistakes. We, we get out of kilter, right? Mm -hmm. And so forgive yourself quickly, but also challenge yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You know, to take responsibility and accountability to say, I'm going to be that better version of myself. Yeah. And this comes to the vulnerability that you mentioned. And also the power of asking for help, mm -hmm. right? When you talk about the team and having the conversations, you know, it's okay for leaders to say, I need your help being a, being a better leader. Right? Yeah. And some of the best leaders we know ask for help. Yeah. Right? And so this is part of being vulnerable, but recognizing that you don't have to make, carry this whole burden yourself. Like we are all sometimes have more than we can manage in, in the moment. And this is why we have support groups, whether they're family, friends, colleagues, or your team that you're relying on. And so with all the techniques and the things that you described, you know, making sure that you know, you are kind and, and forgiving of yourself, but also not just giving yourself a pass and saying, well, explaining away why you behave that way. Yeah. But it's like, look, I vow to be better, mm -hmm. right? And I, 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 here's what I can do for myself and here's what I need from others, right? Yeah. Feedback, support, encouragement, whatever it might be, yeah. right? Um, that, to me, you know, is a powerful combination when you're doing the inner work mm -hmm. and you're reaching out to help, have others help you along that journey. You know, it's um, as I'm listening to you, it makes me think that um, I always have the belief that life is happening for me, not to me. That life um, often offers up some less than uh, beautifully packaged um, opportunities for development um, <laughs> that um, are, are very challenging in the moment. But this kind of practice, someone like this, this, this leadership that I'm describing gives you tons of practice to practice a new way forward and not only model it for yourself, but for your team. And along the way, teach others um, the practice of compassion and, and forgiveness as well to, to further evolve. It also, um, through greater practice, then allows us, no matter how crazy it gets, you know that you have the power to stop the madness in the moment. So. We hope that this conversation has given you a little bit of um, an impetus for reflection and maybe you've got a golden nugget that you can take away to be able to observe, not absorb, slow it down, make sure you practice compassion and really lean into um, an evolution of your leadership when you face the madness.
We'll see you in the next dialogue.